Subscribe if you like scary stories. My girlfriend broke up with me just two weeks ago. I understand that two weeks isn't really enough time to get over a breakup and start swiping on Tinder, but I was feeling really lonely. In just a few days, I was chatting with two girls regularly. I invited both of them for a date on different days, hoping that at least one of them would be a good fit for me. Sadly, the first one stopped responding to my messages, leaving me with only one option, which made me feel even more desperate. The girl in the picture seemed like my dream girl, blonde hair, blue eyes, and really pretty. But her personality, at least through text, was a bit disappointing. She was dull and not good at keeping a conversation going. But I thought some people are just better when you meet them in person, so I decided to go ahead with the date. I chose a budget-friendly restaurant that she agreed was near her place. On the date night I got dressed up, drove to the restaurant, and texted her that I had arrived. I was standing outside the restaurant waiting for her. I was there five minutes early, so I didn't expect her to be there right away. But after waiting for 20 minutes, I tried to call her. After a few rings, she picked up. Hey, where are you? I'm right outside the restaurant, I said. I waited for a few seconds. Hello? She hung up without saying anything. Great. Another girl had stopped responding to me. I felt embarrassed and frustrated. I got back in my car and drove home. I made myself a bowl of cereal, sat on the couch, and tried to forget about everything for a while. I fell asleep around 8, still on the couch. When I woke up, I reached for my phone to check the time, but I couldn't find it. I opened my eyes a bit more and sat up, still looking for my phone. During my search, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. My back door was slightly ajar, just a little bit. It wasn't open enough to see through the gap, but it was open just enough to not be flush with the wall. It was as if someone had gently pulled it almost closed so it wouldn't make a clicking sound. I stood frozen, looking around. Everything seemed to have gone eerily silent. I made one last quick attempt to find my phone, then gave up and walked over to the back door. It was just as I'd noticed, slightly ajar. I always made sure all doors were locked, so seeing this after having a nap just a few feet away was truly frightening. I thought perhaps the intruder had seen me sleeping on the couch and decided to leave. But then the thought of my missing phone crossed my mind. What if they had taken my phone? They would have had to be right in front of me, just a few inches away, possibly watching me sleep. A chill ran down my spine. These thoughts were only making me more terrified. I quickly shut the door and locked it, hoping that whoever it was had already left. I then walked around the ground floor, checking each room, but didn't find anything unusual. Then I went upstairs, which for some reason made me even more nervous. I walked down the hallway, peeking into each room before I reached my bedroom. I searched the room, under the bed, everywhere, no signs of anyone. I stepped back into the hallway, closing the door behind me. I couldn't help but think about how creepy this situation was and tried to figure out the best way to contact the police without my phone. But then I heard something. Quiet, soft breathing coming from the closet behind me. I was paralyzed with fear. The longer I stood there, the more terrified I became. I bolted for the stairs and ran out the front door. There was a gas station at the end of the street, so I sprinted all the way there and asked them to call the police. By the time everything was sorted out, there was no one in my house anymore. My phone was still missing, but that was the only thing that was gone. Luckily, I had backed up my account, so it wasn't too difficult to get a new phone and transfer all my apps and data. A few weeks later though, I went back on Tinder, and that's when I started connecting the dots. The girl who had stopped responding to me and eerily answered my phone call no longer had a profile. I thought that it was actually possible that they had gone to the restaurant, but instead of meeting me, they had followed me home. As for why they took my phone, I'm not sure. The only reason I can think of is that they didn't want me to call the police or show them their Tinder profile. There are still a lot of things that don't make sense though, like why they only took my phone and what they were doing in my house while I was asleep. I was a 26-year-old woman, but let's rewind to when I was 23 and still in university. During the latter part of my university days, I was quite active on Tinder. I wasn't necessarily on the hunt for a serious relationship, 
but I wasn't completely against the idea either. If things started to get serious with someone, I'd give it a shot. But if not, we'd just enjoy our time together and then move on. One Friday after classes, I returned to my dorm room and spent some time swiping left and right on the app, hoping to find something fun to do over the weekend. After a while, one of the guys I had swiped right on responded. We chatted for about an hour, and then he asked me if I'd like to go out with him on Sunday night. I said yes, even though I thought it was a bit soon for him to ask me out. We continued texting for a bit, mostly talking about school and our hobbies. He mentioned that he also attended my university and lived in a dorm on the other side of the campus. We exchanged a few more texts on Saturday, and then on Sunday, we met up at a popular restaurant not too far from the campus. Throughout dinner, he seemed like a perfectly normal guy. So normal that he was almost a bit dull. I found him attractive, though, and I thought that maybe he was just holding back because we had just met. After we finished eating, we went outside and agreed to see each other again the following week. As I was saying goodbye and starting to walk away, he asked me if I needed a lift home. Since I lived on campus, I didn't have a car and walked everywhere, including to the restaurant. I was surprised that he had a car, considering he also lived on campus, but I was even more surprised when he offered to drive me home. It seemed like he was trying to make a move, which I wasn't expecting. But since I had enjoyed my time with him and he seemed like any other guy, I accepted his offer. The campus was a 25-minute walk from the restaurant, so at the very least I'd get home quicker. He led me to his car, an older black Honda SUV, and I got in the passenger seat. As soon as we hit the road, things started to feel a bit awkward. I attempted to strike up a conversation, but he wasn't engaging. So I leaned back in my seat, and we both fell silent. After a few minutes, he made a left turn, but the campus was to the right, in the completely opposite direction. A knot formed in my stomach and my body tensed up. I was overwhelmed by a sense of impending doom. Hey, I think you missed the turn, I said, doing my best to keep my voice steady and hide the fear I was feeling. No, he muttered. I glanced at him, but his eyes were fixed on the road. Where are you taking me? I asked. He didn't answer. I didn't know what else to say. In a final attempt to defuse the situation, I told him to let me out of the car. Again, he didn't respond. As he drove further away, the surroundings became more and more isolated. My mind was spinning with fear, and I was terrified of being taken too far away to find a way back. I still had my phone in my pocket, and I knew he would take it as soon as we stopped. My only plan was to try to quickly pull out my phone and dial 911 before he had a chance to react. I waited until he started to make a turn. As soon as he looked the other way, I took out my phone and, with trembling hands, dialed 911. He noticed immediately and tried to snatch my phone while still driving. I managed to keep it out of his reach as the phone rang. As soon as I heard a voice on the other end, I screamed for help, shouting out the street names and the direction we were heading. The man was still trying to take my phone, hitting me and pulling me towards him. In the struggle, he lost control of the car and crashed into a speed limit sign. I was disoriented and my vision was blurry, likely from a concussion. I could hear the 911 operator's voice coming from somewhere under my seat. For a moment, I forgot the situation I was in, but when reality hit me again, I quickly looked around. The windshield was shattered, the airbags had deployed, but the man was nowhere to be seen. I tried to look out the windows but he was gone. I didn't even remember seeing the windshield shatter or the airbags deploy so I might have been unconscious for a few seconds or even minutes without realizing it. I found my phone and told the operator what had happened and that I was okay. The police arrived shortly after. I didn't have any serious injuries, just some aches and pains. But what hurt the most was the fact that I was so sure they would catch the man, given his name, description, and license plate. But I was wrong. The car had been stolen the day before, which was probably why he abandoned it after the crash. His name was likely fake, and his Tinder account had been deleted, so all they had was a description of what he looked like. I should have been more cautious, and I certainly have been since then. What he intended to do with me is too horrifying to even contemplate. I just really hope that he's not out there trying to do the same thing to someone else. I got to know a guy who I'll call Bob through an app called Tinder. He was a nice, articulate guy, 
and we had been on about four or five dates before he asked me to come over to his place. I had known him for nearly a month, and felt ready to take our relationship to a more private setting, away from the public eye. I drove to his place at 6.30, as he had promised to cook a nice homemade dinner for us. When I arrived, I noticed two cars parked in his driveway. I hadn't asked him if he lived with anyone else, so I assumed that might be the case. I didn't see it as a negative, but I felt he should have mentioned it before I came over. I circled back and parked my car on the street in front of his house. I walked up to the front door and rang the doorbell. Bob opened the door promptly, greeted me with a big smile, and invited me in. At first glance, the state of his home was a bit shocking. I'm not the type of girl who's after a wealthy guy to spoil me, but I do appreciate a man who can keep his place tidy. His house looked like it belonged to a hoarder, with garbage strewn about, random items scattered on the furniture, and barely any space to walk. I put on a fake smile and followed him into the kitchen, trying my best to hide my revulsion. By this point, I had pretty much decided that Bob probably wasn't the guy for me. However, I didn't want to be rude and make a hasty decision just based on the state of his house. The kitchen was a bit tidier, as if he had made an effort to clean it recently. On the table were two plates of food, but after seeing the rest of the house, I had lost my appetite. I politely told him that I wasn't feeling well and would try to eat later. His reaction was a bit strange. He just stared at me, seemingly taken aback by my response, and seemed lost for words. I couldn't maintain eye contact with him for more than a few seconds before it became uncomfortable. When I looked away, he seemed to snap back to reality. Oh, okay, that's fine, he said, taking my plate and putting it in the fridge. I tried to make conversation, asking about his day and if anything new was happening in his life. He responded, but it seemed like his mind was elsewhere. He kept glancing around, trying to be subtle about it, and seemed a bit anxious. His behavior reminded me of the two cars I had seen in the driveway. Hey, I noticed you have several cars in the driveway. Do you live with others? I asked, trying to sound casual. Uh, yeah, they're out of town for the weekend, he replied. He then stood up, excusing himself, saying he needed to take a phone call, and walked back towards the living room. His behavior was completely different from before, and I didn't like it one bit. I could hear him whispering on the phone for about half a minute. Then he returned and placed his phone on the table. Sorry, he said, sitting back down. I forced a smile, but it was becoming increasingly difficult to pretend. I didn't feel safe or at ease in his house, and I knew I had to get out. He started looking around again, and I was gathering the courage to tell him I was leaving when a loud noise came from upstairs. As soon as the noise echoed, Bob looked straight at me, as if trying to gauge whether I had heard it. Give me a second he said, standing up and quickly heading upstairs. Just a moment later, his phone still on the table, lit up. Normally I wouldn't pry into someone's personal matters, but given the circumstances, I felt it was justified. I stood up and leaned over the table to see a text from an unsaved number. The message was brief. Do you have her yet? I froze in panic for a moment, trying to make sense of the message, when I heard footsteps descending the stairs. I bolted out the front door, with the sound of footsteps quickly following me from inside the house. I jumped into my car and sped out of the neighborhood. After some time to collect myself, sitting in my car in my own driveway, I called the police. I wasn't sure if something sinister was happening, but I didn't think I was wrong to suspect it. Why would he lie about being alone? And what was the meaning behind that text? It all seemed to add up in my mind. The police questioned Bob and his roommate who had been upstairs. They even allowed the officers to conduct a brief search of the house, but they found nothing to suggest any ill intent. The officer empathized with me, saying they understood my concerns and that they would have felt the same, but there was nothing more they could do. So now, all I can do is hope that I misinterpreted the situation, and there was nothing more to it. Just a harmless lie, he told, and an odd text message that meant nothing.